Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world All ye holy saints of God, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right, we have come to the final class, as I mentioned last week, and uh, this class is on prayer, which is a very, very important topic, and uh, we'll cover the, the catechism lesson on prayer, and then I want to go into a little bit of detail on the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. So first of all, what, how would we define prayer? Well, the Catechism defines prayer as the lifting up of the heart and the mind to God. Thinking of God, lifting up our heart to Him. You might say communicating with Almighty God. And what a privilege it is for us, His creatures, that we can talk to God. And there is this difference, there's a lot of differences, between speaking to God and speaking to someone else. Let's say someone else very important. If you were going to speak to someone that was very important, you'd have to get an appointment. You'd have to wait till that time. And you might be given a short amount of time. But we're speaking to God. We can speak to him all day long. And he is able to listen to each person who is speaking to him. We don't have to get an appointment. And it doesn't mean that he can't speak to others or others can't speak to him. He can, he can focus, you might say, to use a human term, on us and our petitions and our thoughts and prayers, um, as well as everyone else who is communicating with him. So it's communicating with our creator, lifting up our heart to him. And speaking of the fact that we can communicate with God throughout the day, um, reminds me that there's a saint, a Jesuit saint, he was a lay brother, and in fact, there's a window of him at Mount St. Michael. And if my memory serves, his feast is this Saturday, St. Alphonsus Rodriguez. St. Alphonsus Rodriguez was a Jesuit lay brother, um, maybe around the year 1600 or so, or early 1600s. And the other religious that lived with him observed how he seemed to be always so recollected. And we use that term recollected, meaning thinking of God or united with God. And his superior once asked him how much of the day he was not recollected or not thinking of God. And he said maybe about 15 minutes of his waking hours that he wasn't consciously thinking of God or uniting himself to Almighty God. So prayer then again, lifting up our heart and mind to God. Why do we pray? Why must we pray? Well, first of all, we pray to adore. We adore God. Because we are his creatures and we owe him adoration. We owe him worship as our creator, a basic duty of a creature. We also pray to thank Almighty God for the blessings we have received. And that's very important because if we don't thank him, then we don't deserve to receive future gifts and blessings from him. So it's important that we thank God for, for everything that we have received from his hands spiritual and temporal. So many blessings. We also pray to ask forgiveness for our sins, to ask for God's pardon, to ask for his mercy. And that's very important. And then, of course, we pray to petition what we need, to ask for what we need, to beg forgiveness and then to ask for what we need. So we say that these are the four ends of prayer, the four reasons why we pray. 
Uh, and I'll just read it from the book because it adds just a tiny bit with the, um, it says, first, we pray to adore God, expressing to him our love and loyalty. Second, to thank him for his favors. Third, to obtain from him the pardon of our sins and the remission of their punishment. So pardon or forgiveness, but also to satisfy for God's justice uh, because of our sins. So third is to obtain from him the pardon of our sins and the remission of their punishment. And fourth, to ask for blessings for ourselves and others. Um, even though God knows, because he knows all things, he knows what we need, both spiritually and physically or temporally, but he's not going to give us what we need if we don't ask him. Because our Lord said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. And in, in fact, speaking of our Lord, one of the things that's very interesting in the Gospels is that it often mentioned that he went out into the desert to pray. At times it mentions that he spent the whole night in prayer, prayer to his heavenly Father. So our Lord is a you know, perfect example to us of prayer. Now, this is why we pray. And another important question is how? How should we pray? If we want to pray well, how do we pray? So different um, reasons, or, or I should say different uh, qualities of our prayer, I guess we could say. Um, feel free to come up here if you want to one of these desks or whatever. So how should we pray? First of all, we have to have a deep conviction of our need. And and I guess we could call that humility. We have to understand how totally dependent upon God we are, that without him we can do nothing good. We're entirely dependent upon him. So we have to pray with a conviction of our helplessness and our dependence on God. Second, and the book actually, the catechism actually lists this one first, with attention. So it would make no sense to speak to someone and to have an audience with someone and to be thinking about something else, focused on something else, distracted. So that would be irreverent. Now we'll come back to distractions because we all have distractions during prayer and that doesn't mean that our prayers were not beneficial. But we must make the effort to pray with attention. Think about what we're praying for. Um, Third, we pray with a great desire for what we ask of God. We really desire it when we ask for something. Um, if we're lacking that, we may not obtain what we ask for because we don't. We ask for it, you might say, haphazardly, without that that great desire for God's blessings. Uh, fourth, we have to have trust in His goodness. Trust in God. And our Lord talked about this on a number of occasions. He said to the, the apostles, when you pray, believe that you, can, you will receive what you ask for. And according to your faith, it will be granted. Which is, in that, in that use of the word faith, this is what he means. We trust that God will give us what we need. Now sometimes somebody might pray and the attitude of this person is, well, I'm going to pray because I know I should, but God's probably not going to hear me. God's probably not going to grant me what I need. Maybe they don't express it in so many words, but a lot of people have that attitude. I'm probably not going to get what, I, what I'm asking for. Okay? So that's a lack of trust. And a trust in Almighty God. So we must have great trust in God. And then the fifth point on how to pray is with perseverance. And what that means is we don't just ask once or twice, especially for a great grace. We have to continue to ask for it, continue to pray, continue to petition Almighty God for what we need. So these would be the qualities of our prayer. Now, what might be the reason that we try to pray as well as we can and we pray with this and we don't obtain what we're asking for. 
we, we do this, and our prayer doesn't seem to be answered. Why would that be? Well, first of all, it's very important for us to understand and to remind ourselves that God hears every prayer. God always hears our prayers, but he doesn't always give us what we ask for because, as a loving father, he knows what is good for us. And oftentimes what we ask, what we petition, may not be for our, our welfare, for our best, uh, you know, for our, for our good, for our welfare, the best thing for us. Uh, especially when we ask for temporal blessings, uh, material things, or, or temporal, physical health, and so forth. What if God knows that if a person who is sick were to get well, that this person then would forget about God, forget about prayer, and end up losing his soul? Then God would not give that person the health that he or she is praying for. God knows the future, and he knows you know, what we will do with the blessings that he gives us. And so especially when it comes to temporal things, somebody is praying for a better job or, you know, material blessings. Well, let's say somebody prays for great wealth. To win the lottery, people do that. Pray to win the lottery. Well, what if God, who knows everything, knows that that person would win all this money and then become very worldly, very materialistic, and end up losing his soul? So that's just an example of why someone might not obtain what they asked for. And also maybe they just asked for it once or twice, but we have to pray with perseverance. We have to continue to ask for it. Continue to petition God. Now, above all, we should pray for things for our spiritual welfare, which means, above all, ultimately, our salvation. Final perseverance and salvation. That we will get to heaven. That's what we call final perseverance. Um, so spiritual goods, I'll put it down like this, all spiritual goods, we pray for the grace to acquire a virtue, to overcome temptation, to conquer sin, uh, etc. So spiritual goods are the, the thing we should especially pray for. That doesn't mean we can't pray for material blessings. But when we pray for material blessings, we should say, I desire this or I ask for this as it is in accord with God's holy will. We're going to come to the Lord's Prayer a little later in this class, in which our Lord said, you know, in his prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Every time we say the Our Father, Thy will be done. And so we recognize that God's, that, that God's desires for us, his plans for us, his wishes for us, his, his knowledge of what we need, that's the most important thing. So spiritual goods... And also, another reason why we might not obtain what we ask for, because, first of all, it might not be for the good of our soul. Also, uh, when we pray for others, our prayer will not infallibly be granted. And what I mean by that is, let us say that you pray for the conversion of a loved one, and you pray for it every day. What will happen? God will give that person an abundance of graces. But God will not force that person to accept those graces. Because we all have a free will, and God respects that gift that he gave us of free will. So he never forces anyone. So we pray for someone. We pray for our loved ones, etc. God gives them grace because of our prayers. But then they have to cooperate with it. They have to use it. So... Uh, a lot of times the catechism will say, well, we always get what we obtain when we pray for ourselves, for things that are useful for our salvation. And, and again, I, I want to repeat what, I mean, what I'm trying to say here. That doesn't mean we can't or shouldn't pray for others. We should. But we can't guarantee that however much we pray for them, that they will correspond with the graces that God gives them. All right, um, so the, the five qualities of prayer or the re or how we should pray, very important. Now, I mentioned earlier about distractions. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, 
We all have distractions during prayer because our mind kind of jumps around. We do the best we can. We try to pray well, but we still have distractions. Are distractions a sin? And the answer to that is no, unless they are directly will. So everyone is going to have distractions. We have to try to get rid of distractions, try to pray well. Uh, one of the ways we can do that is have a place to pray, maybe a room, a room or there's a little shrine where you concentrate your focus, and you try to, to pray maybe at a time of day when you're not besieged by other cares. You try and put those worries out of your mind and think to yourself, well, right now I'm going to be talking to God. Right now I'm going to be praying, so those things are unimportant right now. Uh, so we do the best we can to fight off distractions, but unintentional distractions are not sins. And in fact, a person can be besieged by distractions and continue, continually fight them off. That person's prayer may be more valuable, more meritorious than that of another who didn't have very many distractions because this person with all these distractions is fighting them off. He's, he's, he or she is making the effort to pray, to concentrate. So distractions should never discourage us. But intentional distractions, we're saying prayer, well, I want to think about this instead. No, knowing it and intentionally being distracted, that would be a venial sin because it would be irreverent to God to say, I want to listen because I'm going to talk to you. And then intentionally turning our mind to something else. So that's um, one point I wanted to mention, distractions. And the other would be the types of prayer. So we say that there are two categories or types of prayer, and they are called mental and vocal. Now, mental prayer is more of the mind and the heart than of the lips. So you hear the word sometimes meditation. Meditation is a form of mental prayer. But mental prayer means we lift up our heart to God, we think of him we uh, petition, petition him, but in a silent way. You know, we, we, we offer the desires of our hearts, our, uh, our strivings and our, our, go our desires, our, our, um, our plans, our goals, our um, resolutions, etc. But not necessarily with a set form of words. So mental prayer is prayer, again, of the mind, and of the heart. Now, this is the best kind of prayer. Because really, when you think about it, vocal prayer, which is prayer of the lips, meaning, and I don't mean just of the lips, but it means we are saying specific words with vocal prayer. Like the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Acts of Faith, Hope, and Charity, the Rosary. You're, you're using your lips, you're forming words. That's vocal prayer. But if you think about it, vocal prayer wouldn't be prayer at all if it doesn't contain that aspect. So really, all of our vocal prayers are also mental in that they come from the, you know, the thoughts come from our mind and our heart. Now, vocal prayers are good. Mental prayer is better. But vocal prayer is very beneficial for a number of reasons. One of them is that you can pray with others. You can pray in a group. You can pray in common. And we re recall the words of our Lord, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So when we pray out loud, we pray together, we're praying with others, there's an added value to our prayer. Also, some people will find it hard to make purely mental prayer without words, etc. Then they can use a prayer, in a prayer book, maybe read it slowly and think about the meaning of the words. Because the whole idea of prayer, again, is lifting up our heart to God. And in this regard, I would say this too. We are all different. We are all different insofar as the types of prayer that appeal to us and so forth. The important thing is that we give God that adoration and thanksgiving, petition, the sorrow for sin, contrition, that, is, that we owe Him. And that we, again, lift up our mind and heart to God. Now... St. Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the church, wrote a great book on prayer, and he sums it all up by saying, those who pray will go to heaven, 
and those who do not pray will go to hell. That's kind of his brief summation, that you can't save your soul without prayer. And uh, again, we have those words of our Lord, asking you shall receive, and many other quotes of our Lord. He said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you, and so forth. He also talked about you, parents. He said, you don't give bad things to your children. They ask you for food, you're not going to give them a stone or for instead of bread or something like that. And if you, who are imperfect and sinful as we are, if we love our children and give good things to our children, how much more will not your Father in heaven, who loves you more than any human parent could, will he not give you what you need to save your souls? So we we want to always remember that, the love of Almighty God, the love of our Father for us. And as I said, we're going to get to the Our Father, but when our Lord, this disciple said to our Lord, teach us to pray, and he gave them the Our Father. And notice how he begins the prayer, Our Father, addressing God as a Father, because he's the most loving of fathers. So prayer is communicating with him, but also asking um, for what we need. Um, it says here, we should pray especially for ourselves, for our parents, relatives, friends, and enemies, for sinners, for the souls in purgatory, for the Pope, the bishops, and priests of the church, and for the officials of our country. Notice that temporal rulers as well. Um, many intentions to pray for. Why do we not always obtain what we pray for? I mentioned this, but it, it bears repeating. We do not always obtain what we pray for, either because we have not prayed properly, or because God sees that what we are asking for would not be for our good. So again, especially the good of our soul, the spiritual aspect. Some people only think of prayer when it has to do with physical danger that they're in, you know, physical suffering, that type of thing calamity. They don't think about praying for spiritual good, spiritual things. All right. Um, another question I want to read, how do we know that God always hears our prayers if we pray properly? We know that God always hears our prayers if we pray properly because our Lord has promised, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. All right. Um, what are the prayers that we should learn? Well, every Catholic should know by heart, of course, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, the Act of Contrition. It's also good to know the Acts of Faith, Hope, and Charity, and, of course, the Apostles' Creed, we say at the beginning of the Rosary. So those are basic prayers. But I want to talk about one, and it's the shortest prayer, or one of the shortest prayers, and it's the one we use every time we pray, and it's called the Sign of the Cross. So this is a beautiful prayer that you know goes back to the early centuries and when we make the sign of the cross we're physically moving our hand in the form of a cross we've got the 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 uh, hor the horizontal i mean the vertical we have the vertical part of the cross and then the horizontal part when we touch ourselves on the forehead the breast and then the shoulders so we're tracing on ourselves the cross and then the words we are saying in the name of the father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So every time we do it, we are professing our faith, our Catholic faith, in two doctrines of the faith. One is the redemption, that Christ died for us on the cross. Again, we're tracing the cross on ourselves as a reminder, Jesus loves me so much, he shed his blood, he died for me on the cross. So we're reminding ourselves of the passion and death of our Lord. And then the second uh, doctrine that we give expression to is the Trinity. Because notice we say, in the name, not in the names, plural, but in the name of, and then we name the three divine persons. So the way we say that, of course it's based on the words of our Lord. He said to his apostles right before his ascension, go forth and teach all men whatever I have commanded you, and baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So our Lord gave us that those words. So when we make the sign of the cross, we say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We, we profess our faith in the Trinity. We're saying, in effect, I'm praying in the name of the, the Blessed Trinity. I worship Almighty God, the Most Holy Trinity. All right. Uh, I want to go on to, I mentioned this, 
that we would talk about the Lord's Prayer. So let's do that. And the Lord's Prayer has seven petitions. Now we start off by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. And we'll think about those words. That's kind of like, uh, before we begin the petitions, we address God. And then we're going to address seven petitions to him. And notice, seven is, is like a perfect number, a number of perfection. There are seven sacraments, seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, seven main virtues, and so forth. So we begin, before we ask those petitions, we begin by addressing God as a Father. Now, we can think about how strange this prayer sounded to the ears of the Jewish people, because from the Old Testament, they were taught to fear God, to dread Him. They... Uh, wouldn't pronounce his name, etc. They had this fear of God, his justice. And our Lord is saying, think about God as your father, as a loving father who loves you, as the best of all fathers. So we begin by addressing Almighty God as our father, and also reminding ourselves not only that he is in heaven, but that's where we are destined to be. We are destined to be with him. So we're lifting up our hearts to God in heaven. And then we say, Hallowed be thy name. Now, hallowed, or hallowed, kind of an old English word means, may it be sanctified, may it be honored, may it be praised, may it be blessed. So when we say, Hallowed be thy name, we mean that we want everybody in the world to worship God, to honor Almighty God, to treat His holy name with reverence. We have this desire that everyone will love and serve Almighty God. In effect, that's what we are saying, that nobody will misuse His holy name. Everyone will love Him, will serve Him, will worship Him. That's our petition. Um, Thy kingdom come. Now, our Lord often talked about his church as his kingdom on earth. The kingdom of God, uh, meaning his church. So the kingdom of God would be um, in heaven, but also is the church on earth, and it is the, um, I guess you could say, his kingdom would be the society of all of those who believe in him, who love him, who serve him. So if we want his kingdom to come, we want it to take place on this earth where everybody worships Almighty God, loves God, serves God. So we're, we're asking for a lot of things when we say, thy kingdom come. We also say, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. Now, we remember the words of our Lord in his agony in the garden when he said to his father, not my will, but thine be done. And there's no more important attitude that we have regarding Almighty God than that his will be done in our lives, in you know the lives of, of those we love, etc., that everyone will do his will. Now, God's will is going to be done whether people want it to be done or not. But there are many things that take place in the world that are done by, we could say, God's permissive will. In other words, he gave us a free will and he allows us to use it. Many people abuse their free will, they offend God, they commit sin. So they're not, they're not doing his will, but his will is being done in the sense that they will ultimately be judged. And sadly, many souls will be lost because they did not love and serve him. So we're praying that everyone will love and serve Almighty God. Everyone will strive to do His holy will, and especially I, you know, each of us as we pray, may I always do Thy holy will, O oh my God, and may Thy holy will be done in my life. Um, 
you know, the saints tell us, Saint Alphonsus, I mentioned him earlier, has a wonderful book on the will of God, conformity, as the saints say, of our will to the will of God, meaning that we only want what God wills. And he even uses the term uniformity, so that our will is one with God's will. So all of these ideas are contained in that, that idea. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we say, the second half of the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Now, when we say that, we're not just asking for physical sustenance, you know, material food. We're talking about bread, our daily bread, our physical needs. We're asking that all of our physical needs be taken care of, but especially our supernatural needs. Because we need God's grace much more so than we need, you know, physical nourishment and sustenance. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, in other words, our sins. And then we go on to say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if you think about that, the meaning of that is in effect we're saying to Almighty God, I don't expect you to forgive me if I am not forgiving those who have offended me. If I don't forgive others, I don't deserve to be forgiven. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As our Lord said on another occasion, the Sermon on the Mount, forgive and you shall be forgiven. So practice mercy and forgiveness and charity towards others if you want to be dealt with by God in a merciful manner, in a forgiving manner. So we ask forgiveness for our sins, but we also profess our willingness to forgive others. Uh, and then the final two petitions, um, lead us not into temptation, and but deliver us from evil. Now, this is interesting. Um, the so-called Pope, Francis, changed the Our Father. You probably heard about this. Uh, I think it was last, well, about a year ago. And he said, well, and, and in a way what he said is true. Well, God doesn't lead anybody into temptation. God doesn't will temptation. He doesn't want anybody to fall into temptation. So why does it say, lead us not into temptation? Well, the point is two things. First of all, these are the words of our Lord. You can't change the words of our Lord. But second, everybody understands what we mean by that. When we say, lead us not, it means don't let us fall into temptation. So this is a petition. Lead us not into temptation is a petition to... Keep thy hand over me, O Lord, as Philip, St. Philip Neri used to say every morning. Dear Lord, keep your hand over me today or I will offend you. He knew how weak he was and how liable he was to sin. So he begged God to, to help him not to fall into sin. So lead us not into temptation means don't let us fall. Don't let us fall when we are tempted. Don't let us fall into the deceits of the devil and so forth. Uh, but deliver us from evil. And uh, of course, the greatest evil is the loss of one's soul. And uh, in scripture, I think it's in the book of the Apocalypse, it's referred to as the second death actually in a number of places in scripture, to be saved from the second death. Because the first death is we will all die one day. But the second death is far worse, and that's the death of the soul for all eternity, the loss of one's soul. So when we ask to be delivered from evil, we want to be spared from, saved from all forms of evil, above all, the loss of one's soul, but even, as well, every form of evil on this earth. And then we end with that Hebrew word, amen, which means so be it. And it's a way of saying, ratifying everything we just said, like repeating it all in one word, um, one short word. Our Lord used that, as you know, whenever he was going to say something important, he would say, amen, amen, I say to you, 
whatever. So it's a it's a word that that kind of is uh, encapsulating and ver and repeating and um, endorsing everything that we have just said. So books have been written on the Lord's Prayer. You know, saints have written extensively about each of the petitions, all the things that that are contained in those petitions, because the Lord's Prayer is the only prayer that Jesus himself gave us when he was on earth uh, in so many words. And so it's the best prayer, the greatest prayer. And when we pray the rosary, we are combining the Our Father with the Hail Mary, which comes second to the Our Father. The Hail Mary, taken from the words of the angel at the Annunciation and the words of Elizabeth at the Visitation, and then the final uh, words added by Holy Mother Church at the time of the uh, Council of Constantinople when, when Our Lady's, or Ephesus rather, mm -hmm. when Our Lady's divine maternity was defined, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. So prayer is so important. Uh, it, it's not how much we know that will determine that we save our souls and where we will be in, in heaven, where we will be in eternity, you know, how high a place in heaven. It's not how much we know, even about our faith. Because think about this. The devil knows more about theology than in any of us in this room. But he can't love God. He does not love God. He can't be humble. He's filled with pride. So prayer is asking God to help us to do what we need to do to save our immortal souls. So yes, we need to study and learn our faith, but we above all need to live it. And to do that, we need God's grace. And we especially get that through prayer.